review boards, funders, education programs, implementers of research, consumers. But one of the things we have to really address is the system of complacency. Have you heard this statement? Chalta hai. It's only a PG thesis. This is where the rock starts. Because this is where you teach young people to disrespect research. That is unethical. The impact of misrepresented research is as common, is far more common than fraud, but the impact is the same. There's a nice little article looking to see, can we look at all the retracted research involving human beings and see how many of them are cited by other articles. They found that 180 retracted papers of clinical research involving humans were cited over 5,000 times, 93% of them involving new research. So fraudulent research leads to new research. And over 28,000 subjects were enrolled in the first set of fraudulent studies, but that spawns 400,000 people subsequently getting involved in research because of this fraudulent study. So, and the papers retracted for fraud treated more patients per study. Probably half of them were invented to begin with. Than papers retracted for error. So many patients are put at risk by retracted studies, and these are conservative estimates, but keep in mind that biased and misinformation papers are never retracted. They also give you wrong results, and they also have the same impact on uh, other people's lives. So the point is, there is a pressure to do research, get results get funding, get promotions, tenure, and it's increasingly complex to keep abreast of all the advances and supervise people to make sure that this research is good. And there's hardly any training in proper conduct of research. So what we must keep in mind from the history you've learned, lessons you've learned from history is that it is a continuum from ignorance to making mistakes, getting away with it, and becoming more and more deliberate in the way you do research because of all the pressures until you get caught or you don't get caught. So we need to keep in mind that all of this starts very, very early in people's careers. So there are now bills pending before parliament to regulate research. All research should be have ethics committees, the committee should be registered. We don't have a dearth of bills and laws. That doesn't change anything in our society. You've got to think of how can we change it by thinking differently. Let's start facilitation. So what we need to do is to focus at individuals and the systems that can get better research. So the individual should be anyone involved in research, from proposing, monitoring, governing. The whole institutions, people who do research, all need to be approached to see how they can be mentored and trained. And the systems that foster openness, transparency, and collaboration, and seek the truth should be given more emphasis than those that exploit, compete, or punish wrongdoers or blame people, or they just profit from other people's misery. So, if you want a great ending, you need a great beginning and a great middle. Let's start by improving the design, the template by which research gets done, and then you can expect better results. So for that, you need to catch people much younger, and influence what they read. No researcher should do a project without reading the reporting guidelines and ensuring that all of that is there in the protocol. So what we did was we said, let's try it with the Clinical Trials Registry India. Now it has many items, 21 items to be disclosed, but nothing to do with methods. So we put in some items, the template was there. How did you randomize? What is the method? How did you blind? We gave drop down lists, PDF documents that explains why you want to do it. Now if you compare, journal publications, which was abysmal about reporting these, and the clinical trials registry documents, you find that invariably the reporting of all these essential elements are far better in the clinical trials registry. Why? Because a template was put in there. That means the protocol is better than what was published. Suggests that uh, one thing to keep in mind is that at present what we are publishing, we can't really rely on. But the future looks good because the template has changed. So let's start with the basics. Educate students and faculty about research ethics. Develop SOPs and disseminate this so people know what these SOPs are. We need a lot more research methodology and statistical methodology training and, and we need protected time for this research. All protocol submissions to research committee should be design specific. 
So if you have an RCT, there's a specific form which should have all those elements in it. If you have an observation study, it should be the stroke document elements in that form, not a generic form, which people don't know what to do with. And we should have ways in which we, the people who review and revise these submissions and understand what it means. See, the problem is ethics committees only look at placebo trials and consent forms. They don't understand the research, the science that goes into it. And they approve unscientific protocols. That needs to change. We should really encourage, see, the DCGI insists that all industry-funded trials are registered. What about us? What about investigator-initiated trials? Where is the institutional mandate to say every trial done in every institution should be prospectively registered? Because Clause 19 of the Declaration of Helsinki says it should be. Fidelity to protocols, respect for integrity, senior researchers should set standards, verify data. We must remember there is an invisible curriculum which is very easily picked up if senior researchers don't set these standards. And uh, we need to do less research rather than more research and research that matches the burden of disease in this country and, find, and what kind of research people in our country need. So we need a good prioritized list of topics that need to be researched. Certainly we need more research on health systems and how to do, how to deliver care and how to translate what is in the bench into the bedside. Because we already know enough, but we don't do it. My suggestion, and I've talked to many people, and we all believe we should have separate research and clinical streams. Starting with, MD students should not be forced to do a thesis, which they don't want to do. The majority of MD candidates in this country are not researchers. What this country needs are clinicians, caring clinicians who can look after people and can teach clinical medicine, but they need to have courses on critical appraisal and pass an exam on it because they need to protect themselves against all the rubbish that's going to come in the name of science when they leave their course so they can protect their patients from what course happened. They don't need to do the research. And there could be people who want to do research, they don't need to do the critical ex this screen, they do the research project. There are many countries where you become a postgraduate, you become a consultant without doing research. In the UK, you don't have to do a top research topic to get a membership, but you have to pass an exam in critical appraisal. Routinely, you go for an exam, then they'll ask you, what is the Cochrane evidence on this? You need to know it. But you can also do research if you wish to. So I think we should start thinking of, and not stop fooling ourselves to think that all people in our country want to do research. They don't. But many of them are extremely good clinicians. Let's not force them to fabricate results. I guarantee you, you look at PG topics in this country, half of them are fabricated. So we are forcing people to do unethical things because of these expectations. So training in critical appraisal and finding and using reliable evidence is absolutely required. We need funding. Research costs money. You, you cut corners, you get sloppy stuff. And you get all your funding from pharma industries, you know where your research is going to go. So every institution that wants to do research should have adequate infrastructure, not only for the research, common facilities that people can use, but for research governance. Ideally, you need an administrator, you need a dean of research, so that that gets priority in that institution. There should be more research fellowships, research sabbaticals. There should be a tenure, a track. People can be researchers without having to go and compete for grants if they produce well. Much more collaboration than competition. And if you want to get advances like what Ajay is hoping, you need interagency and interdisciplinary research. Psychiatrists cannot unravel the mystery of schizophrenia. We've tried. It means a totally new paradigm shift and new methods. So to reclaim the research agenda, the charge to institutions and agencies, it is more important for us to trust and teaching, not get just more funding and get more publications out. Now what about the Indian Nobel Prize by 2020? I'll leave that to you. I think far more important is how about improving the health outcomes for our people. Uh, this is a very good <coughs> picture I'd like to leave you with of what it means to be collaborative. This is Ian Chalmers. He's the prime mover behind the Cochrane Collaboration, which is now celebrating its 20th year. When he was made Sir Ian Chalmers, they asked him to send a picture of himself to put up in the National Portrait Gallery. He asked all of us to just send a picture. We didn't know what it was about. And that's where all of us are. Because he said, that is the meaning of collaboration. 